what would happen to the world if they took, you know, everything that Mozart had done and just burned it and, you know, and forgotten about him? I mean, we wouldn't have that legacy, you know, to look back on. And you start cutting out the things that, 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 that identify who you are and have identified who you are for, you know, 60, 80, 100 years or whatever. You just start, you know, willy-nilly ripping these things out because you don't have a vision to repurpose them. It doesn't mean that it makes it right to take them away. The Paramount Movie Theater in St. John, New Brunswick was a house of dreams. Two generations of Maritimers stole their first kiss here, covered their eyes to avoid a Hitchcock horror scene, cried at the heartbreak of their favorite Hollywood idol. Now, at 64 years of age, it sits empty, facing the undignified fate of countless buildings in the city's uptown, death by wrecking ball. The Paramount Theatre was built in 1948 and it was built in the Art Deco style. It was the pride of Atlantic Canada and people came from everywhere to this theatre. It, uh, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful building in its time. And when they built theatres back then, it was about the event. So when you walk through the doors and you, you know, ascend the stairs into the lobby and the beautiful sconce work and then you walk into the grand room here where I am, and it's just, you know, huge, tall, rolling plaster walls and the attention to detail. And it's just, it was a palace, you know, and it was one of those buildings that when you uh, walked in, you knew you were going to an event. And that's what makes this place unique. A night at the Paramount was a rare treat for Michael McDonald, the son of a single mom who had to work hard to make ends meet. Now that he's 46, the theater has become something more. It represents a time when his city had a heartstring firmly tied to Hollywood. When former St. Johner Louis B. Mayer was building MGM into one of the biggest movie production companies in the world. And when Paramount Pictures built hundreds of these theaters across North America. My name is Michael McDonald. I'm a father and I got two kids and uh, I uh, work at the St. John Regional Hospital in acute care and I've been doing that for about three years. I'm a musician and, uh, and an artist and a bit of a right brain guy. I'm an urban boy. I mean, I was, a, I was born and raised in the uptown and I mean, I lived about six blocks from here and, and uh, the big thing on Saturdays in the early 70s was uh, B Films. The city was just alive with parents dropping off kids and there'd be 500 kids in a, in a line up down around the corner to see a movie here and there'd be 500 kids across the street at the cinema to see uh, a triple feature. You know, so there's a thousand kids in the uptown, and I just remember how how uh, how uh, vivacious this uptown used to be back in those days, and uh, it's fallen by the wayside quite a bit. You know, the King Square area uh, was sort of the cultural center of the uptown, and it's slowly fallen into some decay. The Paramount has been sitting empty for a decade. Mike McDonald yearns to give it a new life. He envisions a combination of a live performing arts space, an independent cinema, and a cafe. He must rally the community to raise enough money to make his dream a reality. These buildings are the buildings that, uh, that attract people. And uh, there's a need for it. We need a venue like this. We don't have one. This building is, is, as a 450 seat um, live venue would be the perfect match. So, I mean, I see pouring my energies into this is to bring the city, to, to start to bring the city back to its cultural uh, vibrancy that it used to be, but it also serves a really strong purpose in uh, being a, a place for the city's citizens to celebrate their own art and culture. The city of St. John is the oldest incorporated city in the country. Blessed with a deep harbor, it was once the busiest port on the eastern seaboard, second only to New York City. The prosperity from shipping, trade, and manufacturing was reflected on the architectural face of the city. In 1877, the Great St. John Fire destroyed overnight what had taken centuries to build. But the city rebounded. In fact, it flourished during the war years. The influx of soldiers brought life to the entertainment district uptown. The city became one of the architectural showpieces of the Atlantic provinces. Since the Great Fire, St. John has had up to 15 operating theaters. Today, the Kent, the Imperial, the Lyric, and the Paramount now named after the square it overlooks, are the only survivors. The heritage stock that we have in St. John 
is unequal in Canada. The area focused around King Square actually has a representative building of every architectural period in the historic development of St. John. Some of St. John's architectural gems still stand. Some have been renovated or put to other use, but many have been displaced by parking lots. Except for photographs, there are no traces of once grand structures such as the Customs House, Union Station, the General Hospital, the MRA Department Store, or the Royal Hotel. We continue to lose those. We continue to lose the opportunity for a rich, vibrant, cultural and social life that will attract people to come, live, work and play and have a high quality of life in the city of St. John. With support from members of the uptown community, McDonald's determination grows. But he doesn't have much time, months, maybe only weeks. Desperate to get people to join in his quest, he turns to a group of filmmakers for support. I was on a shoot one day in St. John in the summer and uh, Mike just walked, walked past the shoot and we started just talking and, and he's like, I want to do something for the event, I want to make some kind of video, I want to show people the inside of the building. Maybe two or three weeks later we, were, we had organized it and we had got inside the building and shot the promo video which would go on to show at the Night for the Paramount event. McDonald premieres the Paramount film at a fundraiser. Tonight will be a major test of community support. This is like a referendum. This is, to me, this is like, uh, you know, the fate of a building is at stake here. And the, the barometer is whether people come to this event means that we can move forward. If no one comes, then it could mean the end of an Art Deco building. So, you know, a really important part of our art and culture infrastructure is at stake tonight. So I'm nervous, yeah. <laughs> Normally you wait for the drum solo at the end. Tonight we're going to start with a real big bang. So let's hear it for Johnny Morrison! We're at the Kent Theatre, which is the Chinese Cultural Center. This is uh, an event that we're holding called A Night for the Paramount. It is a, uh, for all the marbles, uh, it's a, a public engagement uh, event. We have five musical acts going to play. We're raising money to try and keep the building afloat, and everything's at stake. If people come, we continue. If we pack this place, we continue. If no one shows up, there's a real good chance that this building's going to get bulldozed and become a parking lot. You know, buildings at the finest, we got to keep them. So tonight is the night that we find out whether the public cares for the Paramount. The Paramount Theatre is something that, uh, you know, has been part of my past. Went to many movies, and not only movies, but uh, concerts, and uh, it had a big stage. And you knew uh, when you were going to the Paramount, you were going there for something special. I'd hate to see a parking lot be put at uh, Paramount, because I've had so many memories of being there. If they tore it down, I, I imagine they probably just turn it into parking, surface parking. And I, I think that that would add to, to an image of deterioration that we really try to prevent in the uptown. Anyway, you know what? Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about, uh, just for one second, about how important it is uh, to me that you guys all came out and supported this. It really gives me high hopes so that we can continue to uh, bring this building uh, out of the shadows that's been in for far too long. And uh, give yourselves a round of applause, people. You're saving a theater tonight. Last thing I want to do to demolish the building. Because the publicity, because not too many buildings left, this or buildings left in that block. The Paramount is currently owned by Paul Darris, a local real estate developer. He also owned another landmark theater on King Square, the Strand Odeon Cinema. Before he demolished it, the Strand was Canada's oldest operating cinema. It is now a parking lot. The city of St. John is in transition. A largely industrial city, there's growing interest in the uptown from high-tech companies and the cultural sector. But hopes of an urban renaissance have been dashed before, first by the recession, then two years ago, a major blow. A huge oil refinery project was suddenly cancelled. 
A group promoting Uptown St. John has been paying the monthly expenses to the owner of the Paramount, but a buyer has yet to come forward. The Uptown St. John board can't cover the costs forever. Yeah, I think the owner, uh, I mean, he's made his reputation on uh, demolishing buildings uh, for parking lots, so it's not an idle threat. Um, he's done the same thing on a theater on one of the other sides of the square. So uh, it's, you know, it's not like it's an idle threat. This could really happen, and it, it may happen. Um, but at the same time, he, he really doesn't want to tear it down. He wants to see it re reused and repurposed uh, so that there is uh, more vitality in the uptown area. He actually does have a you know, heart for the uptown as well. The property is been for, was hoping for development for the last six, seven years. But no tenants. If we're in the near future, if we didn't find anybody to, or to develop, for, to rent it, or I sell it to somebody, somebody's interested for development, and if that don't take a place, then we're gonna have to put a rock, rock ball to it. While the demolition deadline looms, the Paramount video goes viral. McDonald discovers he's not alone in his quest. Soon after, he meets Harold Wright, St. John's heritage guru. The more Wright teaches him about the legacy of the Paramount, the more he realizes this theater must be saved. You know, as a researcher, historians, uh, when you look at this stuff, it helps piece together the story. Now, this is one of my favorite. Uh, you can see here the building. There's the old marquee. The marquee on there. We've got the Bank of uh, Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia busy. We have next to that Kelp. This is just outstanding. Huh? The, the lobby. Look at that now, lobby. Now, this is the 1950s lobby. But the beauty is, that really, other than the, the carpeting and uh, paint color, it's still intact. This is the interior on opening. Wow. This is 1948, but this shows the, the lower auditorium with over 600 seats, the original paint scheme, the scroll plaster work, all still there. We've got probably about a month before a decision comes down whether they're going to um, tear this building down or not. It's reflective of a what I call the 1950s, 60s, 70s mentality uh, of developing communities by destroying the community. We literally have torn down demolished hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of buildings. Some are iconic buildings like the Customs House and the Union Station. Some of them are residences. Uh, and then there is the, the, the Strand Odeon. Uh, when that closed, uh, it was the oldest operating cinema in Canada. Um, and again, it's now a parking lot. Many St. Johners support McDonald's goal to save the old theater, but there are doubters. Some business people feel his vision is impractical. Some members of the arts community worry the theater will compete with existing venues. Still others are put off by his zeal. Mike McDonald is a, a big personality and uh, fabulous to be around. I, I do enjoy Mike and I would run into him in town. I remember once I was at Starbucks uh, just you know, hanging out waiting for my next meeting, and there he was writing his daily letter to the Premier of New Brunswick to ask to save this Paramount Theatre. So, you know what? Admirable, that passion. The challenge when you have a one person who believes so passionately, they become singular in their vision. And it's very difficult for others to participate in that vision and perhaps to help shape it. I mean, it's called, I think it's called um, the founder's syndrome. And so you see this in startup companies, you see this in all sorts of uh, enterprises that begin from someone's singular passion. When you're one person saying this, a lot of people are gonna say, oh, that can't be done, it can't be done. But you know, I'm gonna do this anyway. I'm gonna go to the wall and see you know, how far I can get. So that's what this journey is all about. It's about one guy trying to raise it, uh, a group of people to see the importance of uh, bringing back an iconic art and culture building like this and repurposing it. McDonald drops everything, takes a leave from work and sets out on what will become a pilgrimage. His trek starts just across the border in Bangor, Maine. 
he will fly halfway across the United States to meet with fellow crusaders, people like him committed to resisting, resisting the relentless urban development threatening many of North America's heritage cultural spaces. Cocaine, won't you come on down? Or whilst the blood clean from your hands, can the cool water wake us from this dream? Cocaine, won't you come on in? I found um, a lady in Chicago, her name is Maureen Sullivan, and she is doing the same thing that I'm trying to do in St. John New Brunswick. She's trying to save a theater. The whole Chicago trip is to get down there and find out, you know, uh, what the consensus is with the public uh, about bringing these buildings back. And, and I, I believe that Maureen shares the same philosophy as me, like I said, bringing the buildings back, bringing these buildings back, bring vibrancy back to the neighborhoods. So here I am at a motel in Bangor, and I'm flying to Chicago in the morning. So, the Windy City. Mike McDonald strides through the airport, the survival of the Paramount Movie Theater in his hometown of St. John, New Brunswick, heavy on his mind. The theater's on death row, set to be executed by a demolition crew, unless he can inspire his community to save it. St. John may boast some of the finest heritage buildings in Eastern Canada, but McDonald's destined for America's architectural mecca, Chicago, Illinois. McDonald doesn't head for the sophisticated center of the city, but to one of the deteriorating neighborhoods on the south side. He has arranged a rendezvous with Maureen Sullivan. Sullivan is leading the fight to save the Ramova Theater, the last remaining old-style cinema in the area known as South Halston. Yes. Oh, thank you. Look at that theater, man. Yeah, that's 1929 at its finest right there. Ramova. Yes. Uh, Ramova, it was a Lithuanian uh, theater, and Ramova means peaceful place in Lithuanian. <laughs> Sullivan and McDonald are fighting the same fight, just on different battlefields. Maybe she has a strategy for victory. The theater's been closed since 1986, and people still have an emotional connection to it, whether it be that they went there or their parents have been talking about it their whole lifetime. Um, with some people who are in their teenagers who are excited about the possibilities, and everybody knows it, it's sitting there empty. So it's a very, it's a mysterious place. The theater opens, not only will it bring more art and culture to the area because we want to make it a performance space, it'll be connected to the schools. And what that's going to do is bring more people, bring foot traffic to Halston Street, and then people will take a chance on opening these businesses back up. And we can get, you know, coffee houses over here and restaurants and boutiques. And it's going to raise property values here. It's going to bring more tax dollars into the area. Um, all of the economic generator uh, things, the standard classic things like jobs, obviously, which we could use. Um, all of those things will actually come back to this. It's, it's the heart of the neighborhood. Sullivan sees the rescue of the Ramova as the key to saving her whole neighborhood. A lot of local businesses are counting on her, especially Bernice's Tavern, just down glass? the street. No, man, the bottle's great. All right. Um, this bar is fantastic. Uh, I, I grew up here. I'm, I'm 50, so I've been here since I was a, just a little kid. In 75, we moved in. We live upstairs, and this is where I grew up. Here, when I was a kid, it was really, this strip was happening, you know, between shoe stores and tavern. There was a tavern every four doors, for God's sake. Tell me, uh, what do you think that would happen to this neighborhood if the Ramova came back? There's a lot of empty storefronts right now. When I was a kid, at the middle of the night, you walk out the door and it was traffic, foot traffic, left and right. What is going on? Foot traffic. The Paramount is a, is a building that was the heartbeat of this part of town. 
kind of like the remote. Over That's here. a good way to put it. And yeah. if the heart is taken away, then the lifeblood stops flowing. Before you know it, things start happening, businesses start opening. The neighborhood comes It's good down. for business. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Maureen connected Mike with her friend and fellow heritage building activist, Jacob Kaplan. Jacob has traveled on Chicago's famed L train for his whole life and has seen a perspective of Chicago from the rails that inspired him to get involved in the fight to save the city's iconic buildings. We wrote an article a few years ago called Save These Theaters, where we focused on three, uh, three decaying movie theaters in different neighbors of the city, and Romova was one of them. And uh, after that, Maureen basically found us and, and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to get things started to, uh, to save this theater. So ever since then, it's been a, a very good friendship, and we've uh, worked together as much as we can. What do you think that the Romova, bringing the Romova back to the area will do? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a business district that had some problems over the years, and, and it, I think if you bring, if you uh, reinvigorate the theater, you know, bring it in and, and uh, reopen it, I think it would bring a lot of people to the neighborhood, and it would really help uh, spur redevelopment of the, of the area. I think it would really be a good thing. When these sorts of uh, institutions, I mean, you can call them institutions, theaters, you know, close, you know, people have less of a reason to go to a place. So, you know, reopening them really would, I think, bring a lot of people back, and I think it's key especially with historic buildings, to, to, to you know, renovate them, rehab them, keep them up, because they're, uh, you know, especially you know, with, the, with the quality of a lot of the construction nowadays, they're, they're becoming more and more rare. I think it's important to, to preserve what we have and, and uh, you know, put some life into it. Growing up, I wanted to be a superhero On my lawn, I'd pretend to be Spider-Man As he saunters through the Chicago Stockyard District, McDonald bumps into another fellow crusader. So we're standing in the uh, old part of Chicago, and this was the factory district. And it's, a, uh, it's an unbelievably cool, cool, rustic part of, uh, of uh, Chicago. And uh, we're standing here getting ready to do an interview uh, with me, and I'm, I'm hanging with the boys, we're getting set up, and this other guy comes walking towards us stranger with a beard looks like Kenny Rogers and uh, he's got a camera in his hand and he uh, looks at us and he goes like this and I went the only way the only you know anybody that works in the film industry knows that that means are you rolling and I just thought to myself this guy works in the film industry it just so happens that he's uh, his name's Bob and he's scouting for a TV show here in Chicago Bob happens to be a member of the Uptown um, Preservation Society Bob's interview the Divine Intervention, take one. Bob, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing, man? This yeah. is really, really crazy. It was, well, you know, it's, it's funny it's, seeing I see a camera in the middle of this place, and it's like, what are you guys shooting? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what the philosophy is about the with, with the friends of uh, of the Uptown and, well, what, and what they want to do? I think, or you know, organically, it's it's two things. It's the I think the core thing is to save the building because it's so spectacular, and they're you know, so the passion of evolved out of the people who went to the movies there, they want to save it just because it was such a spectacular place. It, you know, it's like you walked in, you were like, oh. And that was the big movie houses really had that impact. Kind of the secondary thing and more the thing that actually kind of motivates the, the, the engine these days is the economic development component, where these kind of theaters can actually redevelop a neighborhood. They're the anchor for a neighborhood turning around. And so it's amazing this neighborhood was so vibrant. And then when the theater crashed in the 60s, you know, when it closed up, it kind of led to the demise of the entire neighborhood. So it's really indicative that, the, you know, the, how good those theaters are doing is kind of reflective of how these neighborhoods are doing as well. So I think restoring it is going to lead to some very good things for Uptown. Is in the theme that's been happening all through this whole, uh, this whole day and since we've been in Chicago is that everybody is saying you bring back these buildings, it brings back the neighborhood. You bring back these buildings, it brings back the neighborhood. And it's just over and over and over again. So you know what? You bring back these buildings, it brings back the neighborhood. It's a, it's, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> McDonald sees his struggle in New Brunswick as part of a larger war between economics and cultural heritage, between practicality and nostalgia. In Chicago, he next meets an activist disturbed about the loss of entertainment landmarks across North America. If you look at buildings like the Romova, um, or the Paramount, the Romova was built with an arcade beside it of, of other shops. It's because when people came to the movies, 
They would buy things on the way in, they would buy things on the way out and got people out of their homes, into the streets, and into shops where they could do retail uh, purchases. In 1925, on August 18th, the Uptown Theater opened. It was the pinnacle of Balaban and Katz's seven movie palaces, the first of which began with the Riviera, which is right down the street. Yeah, beautiful. The Uptown is the second largest theater built in the United States. Every major rock band, Bruce Springsteen, The Grateful Dead, The Ramones, played the Uptown Theater. Around the corner from Chicago's Uptown Theater is another of the city's iconic buildings, SNA Studios. This is where Charlie Chaplin made his great films. It's where Gloria Swanson got her start. The hope is it will become a museum celebrating the history of the silent film era. SNA Studios was one of the first six movie production houses and manufacturing facilities. So this space and all the area around it is where films were made. And at that time, films were made um, with nitrates, which were explosive. And therefore, to protect the films, they were kept in vaults. And many of those films are no longer around because people used to roll them down the street and watch them explode for fun. There's a lot of history here, and being able to both compile that in a way that people can have an opportunity to appreciate it, as well as making it available as a space for people to enjoy. As night falls, McDonald's thoughts take a dark turn. What if he fails? What if they all fail? What if the monuments to a once thriving entertainment industry are lost forever to his children and their generation? I'm a little hot because I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated to a degree where it's like, what do I have to do to get it through to the people that this building is an economic engine that's going to revitalize the uptown of St. John, New Brunswick, you know? We are going to lose the Paramount Theater if we don't get off our asses and, and do something about it. We're never going to get this again. We're never going to get this chance again. Whether it turns into a petting zoo, when it's gone, it's gone. McDonald continues his quest to save a heritage movie theater in his hometown. He heads to Canada's capital. He needs to see proof that old cinemas like the Paramount in St. John, New Brunswick can be resurrected. Through the open window, wispy on the wind, comes the sound of a distant parade. I know if I go out to find it, it will always He's greeted by allies, two former St. Johners. The Paramount has special meaning for Jonathan and Lindy Van Emberg. This couple first met at the Paramount as teenagers. They've invited McDonald to show the Save the Paramount video at the restored Mayfair Theatre in Centertown. It's one of only two independent cinemas left in Ottawa. I spend a lot of time at the Mayfair Theatre here in Ottawa. It's a locally owned, private company, they, their slogan is we show movies that you won't see anywhere else and it really has this feel that you go in, you're having this experience. Other towns have done this, they have brought their theaters back, they have recreated that feeling. You know, it's no longer a sterile environment you're walking into. I want the day and night I am not waiting for anything I am not in the fight We're uh, we're all the way from St. John, New Brunswick, and you guys are holding an event for our little theater, and we're really, really happy to be here. So I want you to tell me a little bit about this place. Well, this place was built in 1932 um, in the Spanish Revival style. We show uh, a lot of cult movies, a little bit of second run, but we're trying to phase it out. Um, independent films, uh, show like the Rocky Horror Picture Show every month. That's really fun. We show it every Halloween, and it's huge here. I've been saying and seeing all throughout these journeys when we were in Chicago and repeated over and over again when we were interviewing people they were saying, you know what, these buildings are buildings that define us as a culture. And, uh, and it's one of those things, like we're trying to save our theater back home in St. John, New Brunswick, that if you bring the theater back, you put a, a certain lifeblood back into the, into the neighborhood and then there's like, you know, peripheral spin-offs from that. We've heard a lot from the neighboring pubs and restaurants that say, you know, oh, when you guys have a good night, it, it brings in so many customers for us. And we, uh, we have sort of an old-fashioned neighborhood that we're in. 
and uh, they've been pretty resistant to change. They, they like the, the old theater, and we, we've actually been hosting fundraisers to um, help fight a new project. They want to build a multiplex literally almost, almost across the street from us, and uh, we, we've been kind of hosting the neighborhood resistance. A lot of cities like my city, there's an area on the east side of town where it's just big box stores and it just seems to, it seems to suck people right out of the municipality. Mm -hmm. If we can't find the money right now in these depressed economic times to save our theater, at least we can possibly raise the movement to a more national story level where people will stop and take a look at, 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 the, at what defines them in the buildings and their cultural centers. The Paramount Theatre was built in 1948 and it was built in the Art Deco style. It was the pride of Atlanta, Canada and people came from everywhere to this theatre. It, uh, it, it was a beautiful, beautiful building in its time. And when they built theatres back then, it was about the events. Um, when we got to screen some movies, and uh, it's a beautiful theater, and, and we raised a thousand dollars. You know, it's a dollar by dollar, brother. You know, we're on the plane now. We're heading to Los Angeles, and we're going to show the movies there. We're going to show the Paramount, and, uh, another film that we were invited to show. This is fast becoming uh, an awareness campaign to teach people about the importance of keeping their iconic buildings, and uh, it's about it's become a lesson in uh, in uh, art and culture infrastructure. Uh, rescue and, and art and culture uh, economies and stuff like that and teaching people about the importance of having a solidified art and culture economy. From the capital of Canada to the center of the North American movie industry, there used to be more than 300 movie theaters in Los Angeles. Even in the land of palm trees and movie stars, it seems the lives of cultural property can be cheap. The Save the Paramount short film has caught the attention of a group in Santa Monica. McDonald is invited to show his film at the Lamley Monica Theatre. The Save the Paramount clip is the call to action video that we use to uh, try and raise awareness. So. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today, and uh, um, I love your I love your little your little California here. I might have to. I mean, I may not get back on the plane. Inside the ornament, I think that all these buildings have they become empowered, they become powerful to us in communities because of the energy that's been placed over time. The more time we give them, the more energy we give them, the more they resonate back for us. So when a building becomes historically significant at 50 years old, what's happened in 50 years that's made it historically significant? Warren Sonoda is an accomplished film director living in Los Angeles. Mike met him a few years ago when Warren was shooting a music video in St. John. Warren knows the city and the Paramount Theatre well, and as a filmmaker, has vested interest in cinemas. You need an anchor for every neighborhood. My city is Toronto, and uh, I think of Queen West, and I don't know if you know Queen West very well, yeah, but yeah. Uh, they opened a, a hotel called The Drake. They spent a lot of money on this really kind of tiny boutique hotel. It was kind of, I think it was a halfway house or something. And um, some people thought, well, what? that's weird. That's like kind of the, not, a, the, not a great neighborhood at the time. But when they opened the Drake, it became culturally an anchor for that part of town. And it revived that entire area. And I'm, I'm not talking just revive it. It's created an entire art gallery section of Queen West that never was there before. If you have schools, if you have hospitals, and you're healthy, and you have an economy, economy that's trying to get back on its feet, you have to nurture it with something more than just the bare necessities. You have to give it life, you have to give it culture, you have to give it stories of themselves that they can see. And I think those movie houses, like the Paramount, uh, are, are those types of places. McDonald has dinner with Cayman Grant, a former St. Johner. 
Against all odds, Grant has established herself in L.A. as an actress and filmmaker. You know, advice I'd give is create the, the foundation for people to have dreams. I was able to dream, and I think that when you, if you take away the support of arts and culture, you're taking away dreams of young people and things that they could do, and they could be better at. They, people told me that, oh, you can't go to L.A., you know, you can't do this, you can't, everything was you can't, but it should be you can, and people need to think broader, you know? Arts and culture in general, that gives people the, you know, ability to dream that they can be whatever they want to be. Before he leaves California, McDonald meets with an urban designer. Roger Sherman specializes in reinventing old spaces, but he raises doubts in McDonald's mind. The Paramount will cost more than three and a half million to renovate. Could it be his dream is just too big for a small city in the East? An art and culture economy is, uh, is something that is valid and is something that can uh, change a municipality. It is, but the, but the problem with so many cities is that it's a chicken and egg problem. Our preservationist community doesn't get it. They think that wouldn't it be great to have this done, but they're not concerned with the fact that the owners actually have to make money. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's not enough simply to have a cultural resource. They, they, they don't have the hook. There's no hook. Everybody likes to see, see a theater come back. It's a great comeback, kind of comeback story, but nobody's risking the liability that the owner is or whoever it is who's putting the money in to have to do that, who actually has to think about how they're actually going to pay for it all. Well, Roger's an amazing guy, and he, uh, he talked about a lot of things about, uh, about, about renewal and, 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 the, uh, and the importance of these buildings. And, but he said, but the one thing that he said to me, he said, you know, you know, it's easy to say you want to renovate a building. He says, but, you know, if you, if you don't have the populace to support something like that, you have to find a way. There needs to be a hook that keeps the building going and injects people into the uptown. The problem is we need the money to renovate the building, but we also need the, the population that's going to sustain it, right? And uh, the whole idea is to, is to uh, make that theater work. McDonald travels back across the continent to discover things are worse than when he left. The money keeping the Paramount Theater on life support has run out. So we just got back and uh, the building is running out of time. Uh, the deadline is very, very soon. And I have no idea what's going to happen. Mike McDonald has spread his Save the Paramount message across a continent. But he has to get back to work in the acute care department of the local hospital. His dream of reviving his childhood cinema is dying. Uh, we had an option on the building, our organization did, to, to purchase it for a certain amount of money um, for a year. So we paid on that option, which was essentially the, the expenses for the owner to keep the building standing. Um, and after a year or so, my board, you know, felt that uh, our resources were better utilized elsewhere, where there was potentially more uh, payback in the short term. And, you know, that's, that's just the, the decision that was made for those reasons. You know, these projects are typically, um, you know, five to ten year projects to raise that kind of money, uh, about $3.6 million. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, you gotta, you gotta have a long term commitment there. A small group of supporters demonstrates in front of the abandoned theater. Their hope is to raise enough to at least purchase the building until it can be improved. Today is a little bit of a peaceful protest or a call of action from all our local musicians. We've been uh, playing since 10 this morning, and I think this is going to go probably well into the afternoon. So we have a goal of raising $650,000. We have uh, pledge sheets being signed, and it's basically a do or die kind of time right now. We, uh, we have maybe about a week left. I thought of how much I care about this uh, campaign, and yet I can't really seem to find the money to donate to something that's not guaranteed to go through. Um, but if we could find a way to only um, 
only give if the project is successful, then we have a winner. So if we reach the total amount, we'll call the pledges in and everyone can have ownership of, of being a part of it, uh, the success of the project. Is almost always followed by a refusal. I'm really cynical right now because I don't see any light for this building, but it's darkest before the dawn. Who knows what could happen? But my, my sadness is that we are going to be in St. John a lesson for the rest of Canada and the rest of North America of what not to do. $650,000 to buy the building, millions more to return it to its former glory. In a city of about 100,000 residents, it's going to take much more than singing and wishing. When we released the video, that the video stated what the theater was going to be used for and what St. John thought the theater was going to be used for. But it wasn't what St. John thought the theater should be used for. It was what a very small group of people thought the theater should be used for. It was not so much who stood behind that project as who did not. And you did not see the support of anyone who ran a performance arts company or, uh, was a, perf or a venue. It's an eerie echo of the great fire that decimated uptown St. John more than a century ago. In April, a fire is deliberately set in an abandoned building. It spreads to the Lyric Theatre, a grand silent film house around the corner from the Paramount. There's no saving it. Three stories of history are clawed to the ground. McDonald's vision of a renewed theater district seems to be crumbling too. So I went on Twitter and I saw the feed and it just said that, that a massive fire broke out at 3 o'clock in the morning and the whole building was destroyed. So the whole sort of dream of, of uh, having a Lyric Theater as a part of that whole concept and that dream of having a, a theater district in the uptown is now, as you see, being torn down because the building is so, burned so hot and it's so structurally unsound now that they have to bring it down. It's very disappointing and very disheartening. This is a very sad day for the city. I'm hoping that what happens here today will remind people of really what we have and what uh, what the potential of it is. And I'm hoping that you know, we, we've sort of uh, reached a stage in the evolution of the Paramount project where we're wobbling a bit and there's a bit of uncertainty as to whether the community has the will to carry on. But I'm hoping that uh, perhaps if anything good might come out of this loss today that it might motivate the community to revisit the idea, maybe put a little more energy and support behind it and uh, and, and still make that happen. We, so I think if, you know, if anything good may come today, it may be that the community may refocus its uh, concern and its effort and energy to, to, to save the Paramount. The Paramount is in limbo now. Uh, a, a really big entity has stepped away, uh, one that, that supported me in, uh, in, in my efforts to raise awareness. So now the Paramount Theater is basically now back to being a grassroots movement the loss of the Lyric Theatre seems a premonition for Mike McDonald, a premonition of the death of his beloved Paramount. He's been fighting to salvage it for more than two years. The empty lot where the Lyric used to stand is evidence of how modern city life takes a toll on vulnerable old architecture, and of the greater toll it can take on one man trying to hold on to the cultural icons of his youth in a fast-changing world. Two and a half years ago, I started this project by myself. I was hopeful that it was going to be something great. I thought for sure that, you know, that we could have the wherewithal to make this happen. I'm back to being a grassroots movement of one again. I don't, I don't have any regrets. I learned, I learned a ton. Um, 
but I think that uh, you know it's a hugely it's a huge missed opportunity and it'll always have this little bit of a pang in me I was really hopeful for the Paramount and I, I was really thinking that you know our art and culture community were gonna come behind this and the city itself the people it's, itself would, would would remember what this place was like when this place was, was happening and when the Odeon was happening in this square what a what a cultural you know, what a, what a cultural place that it was. It's taken a bit of a toll on me as far as uh, having any faith in, uh, in anything big art and culturally happening, you know, in the city. And I don't mean that in a negative way because there's a lot of great art and culture going on in this city by various groups that are doing a phenomenal job. It, 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 uh, it, it put me through the ringer a little bit and uh, I kind of don't know where I am now as far as my city is concerned and I don't know uh, if I still have the same zeal for the art and culture scene around here. You know, I kind of feel like I'm behind a huge pane of glass now just sort of looking in.